Joshua, as a computational biologist, uh, how would you array the landscape of what it means to say biological information? That's a good question. I think as a computational biologist, we've been in this weird spot where computational biology really forming a new discipline within biology, which ends up being like the thumb touching all the other different fingers in biology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And what, what's really happened within biology uh, on a very pragmatic level is really every single realm of biology, uh, no matter how, no matter, no matter what you want to study or how you want to study it, it seems is producing just large amounts of data that's really quickly outstripped what uh, many biologists were able to do uh, to, to analyze and make sense of. And so, uh, so that information ends up being really a core uh, opportunity and really what's really been an impetus for more computational approaches to make sense of this together. Yeah, what, what, what are some examples of fields of biology which may have been in the past uh, approached in a more traditional way that now is uh, susceptible to a computational approach? Well, one of the most important probably has been uh, genetic data. Mm. So on the first level, a lot of the early techniques for any, and even even the modern techniques of getting genetic data really required the development of new algorithms and new hardware even to be able to reassemble genomes and in a way that that actually you know you know, you know that, that that was actually deeply connected to the actual technology of connecting and, you know getting the sequencing data yeah. and actually reassembling that yeah well that, that's an area that really couldn't have really matured or be, begun very effectively without computation yeah, and, and that, that ended up only being the beginning, right? So, I mean, that, that, a lot of people point to that as one of the core places in the 90s where computational <coughs> biology really begins. Right. But once you have this big, long sequences of A's, G's, C's, and T's... Uh, About how long is that, 3 billion? Or? Well, for the human gen genome, it's 3 billion, but it's actually worse than that because, because you have m many, many copies yeah, of yeah. that 3 billion. Right. It just ends up being terabytes of data... I mean, now it's at the point where we're actually sequencing patient data, and so it could be a terabyte of data or more for just a single, for a single patient. Mm -hmm. That um, a lot of it's redundant. Um, some of it is just noise and error. But how do you actually process that amount of data down into something that's distilled and clean? Now, now biologists might have an intuition about how to do that for a small amount of data, but very, very quickly that starts to outstrip your ability to kind of by hand move sequences around. And, and, um, and align them and that sort of thing. And then even once you have that aligned uh, genome, an aligned genome is about just two gigabytes of data. Uh, what, what does it mean? Uh, once again, that's not really uh, the sort of data that the human mind is very good at just directly perceiving. Right. So and when you have this long line of data, the, the critical thing is what's a codon, what's a gene, how many are there, how do they relate? What's junk? What's uh, what, what? What is critical? I mean, that's it's not just reading out a long line. Exactly, it's in different chunks, and you don't really understand it, anything to begin with. Yeah, so there just ended up being just a whole host of uh, of problems and questions about how to how to think about what the results of experiments were and how to actually overlay that on top of of a genome. How to do that in a way that's reusable and reproducible and how to handle errors and how to, I mean, so that just the genetic data alone has just been a gigantic area it, of work. It, it's, an, it's a substrate that allows you to develop the, the concepts of information in biology. It, it gives you that, that um, algorithmic expertise, just like we're training uh, machine learning today. You have to use huge data sets in order to train you know, natural language programming for machine learning. Gen the genetic database was what enabled you to begin a, uh, a computational biology discipline. I mean, that, that gave you the raw data. Yeah, I think it also, that's also one of the areas where early on um, biologists recognized that, okay, we, we're going to need people who, right. who are specialized in this. And, uh, and there's a little bit of a bias, or there has been, at least historically, uh, towards experiments, meaning like wet lab experiments right. in biology. Like right. it's not real unless it's in a, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> unless it's in a test tube somewhere. Uh, and genetic data really started to challenge that, saying, well, maybe it's okay if some people actually specialize and all they're doing is experiments <laughs> in, a, in a computer, right? Yeah, and, and in fact, it's not just okay. It's the only way that you can do that. I mean, you can't do it another, another way uh, it, effectively anymore. What I'd like to do, though, is uh, uh, understand that, but what are some of the other categories in biology that are now being susceptible 
to a similar kind. And with genetics, you have no choice. You have to do that. So that makes sense. But what are some traditional errors? Obviously, in medicine and, and healthcare, uh, the, the computation is, is very important in statistically anal analyzing disease or, or uh, various types of diagnostic procedures. Yeah, so what's interesting is that you know, we talk about genetic data, and that's, that was like probably the first place where it became right. very clear that that was needed. But it's really now ubiquitous through biology. Uh, and it's not so much that you need, you know, the, the original genome project was, you know, about a billion dollars and like dozens of lab producing data. And of right. course, that data was too much. But we're, we're at a point now where um, it, it's fairly easy for a small, you know, small lab inexpensively to produce much more data yeah. than that entire collaboration actually yeah. produced. Yeah, amazing. Not, not just in genetics, but like in protein-protein interactions and uh, chemistry-biology interactions. And that, that's one place our group has done a lot of work in understanding how chemicals mm -hmm. interact with biological systems um, and understanding you know, just about um, anything uh, that a biologist can study, uh, even a small group, and certainly the large groups too, <laughs> can produce just large amounts of data very rapidly that have really important insight in them, but you need to start it, thinking about that in a different way. And, and the different ways, for example, in between the genetic sequence, which is a linear sequence, a complicated one, but it's pretty linear, versus proteins where you have three-dimensional structures, and now AlphaFold is able to do remarkable predictions in terms of, of uh, protein structure, uh, and in, in a three-dimensional sense, you know, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, so um, that, that's a great example. So like one of the big uh, the big questions people have is like, you know, if you go from biology, if from, uh, from like the DNA first, like yeah. then there's the RNA, there's the RNA structure and exactly all the rules and mechanisms involved in that. There's also structure in DNA too, yeah. which has been a big, a big place of, uh, 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 of study too. And in general, in the way how it works in biology is that we can usually kind of think about the rules that give you kind of like the first order approximation of how things are. But then um, we also know that there's exceptions to those rules. Those exceptions also have uh, have a certain pattern to them, and one of the distinctions of biology is like for just about every single rule there are exceptions, <laughs> yeah. and then those exceptions matter. Yeah. And so you, after you get that first uh, that first you know first approximation, you can try and do your second and then third, and each of the times you do that, you kind of pick up more and more. So there's biology. You can understand DNA as a as a as just like a linear sequence. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Right. You can start thinking about the structures. Then there's RNA. And that tends to have some pretty important three-dimensional structures too. There's a, a whole bunch of really key work that was done early on to start understanding RNA structure, and that's still some open questions there. And then proteins come from, from RNA mm -hmm. as well, so how do we think about the structures there? Um, but um, now people are still looking at how to understand epigenetics in DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also imaging data too that comes up, which is like a totally orthogonal direction, right? Right, right. So you have all, all this stuff that's very specific to, uh, to biology there, but, uh, but all, there's all this uh, imaging data you can collect as well, and how do you interpret that? That can be everything from looking at things underneath the microscope to understand tissue and the disease there and tracking individual cells over time. Um, all the way to looking at satellite data to understand how- e Ecology. It, yeah. And obviously, patient data in, in uh, radiography and, FR, and MRI and CAT scans, all of those are digitized and can be analyzed. I mean, that's you know, incredible amounts of data. Yeah, and you also mentioned the, the healthcare data, too. So, yeah. you know, I'm a physician as well as a computational biologist. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and for a long time, the hope has been that, you know, uh, healthcare data would move to digital, which it has for the most part, and that we'd have ways to look at that to ask scientific questions. And, and th this is interesting, right? Because uh, because what we really want to do, honestly, is be able to understand, you know, in ethical ways, to be clear, uh, how human biology works using humans as the model organism. <laughs> now, not experimenting on humans in an ethical ethical way, but if we could look at the data that's already being incidentally collected in healthcare and get insight into how human biology works, I mean, that 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 would be far better than working with just mice or, or some other model workers. Sure. And you would think the digitization of uh, imaging is an enormous area that, that machine learning can work with. I mean, it would be a long process before you trust it. You'd want to over oversee it. But over time, I would think it would become more accurate. Yeah, that's, that's the, 
that's the other realm of how this actually, uh, how you know, all these advances that have been happening in machine learning. I mean, in, in image analysis and also in, in you know, analysis of, of DNA, how, how do those impact the clinic as well? Uh, and, and I think what we're seeing, though, is like a really good um, exchange between, between these two fields right now, which, which is really, really exciting. And it's creating an opportunity for, um, you know, for a lot of advances in the, in the basic science. Now, now, one of the big questions that come up, uh, uh, up in this, you know, you kind of think about that bias that was originally there in, in biology, which has been changing a lot, is that, you know, it's not really biology unless it's, you know, in, in like a test tube <laughs> or, or in the wet lab or you know, looking at something that's not in the community, there was a strong bias against that uh, in a way that, uh, that, uh, that I think philosophy actually has helped us a great deal is thinking through you know, whether or not a simulation can be an experiment too, mm, right? Mm, mm. And whether or not um, looking at testing hypotheses using you know, clinical data, can that be an experiment too in an mm. important way in, like a scientifically, in a scientifically sound sort of way? And, and, and of course we know in physics, for example, that but there's lots of questions you can ask, and you can't really ever ever approach. Even, even in principle, you can't get you get to. Yeah, as, simulating like the universe yeah. evolving from the Big Bang. And, and, and so it's a, it's a similar analogy in biology. There are things that you w would be beyond possibility in actual experiment or observation that you can you can do in a simulation. Yeah. So to, to give an example of this, um, uh, we often want to know how um, how drugs become toxic, and you can do that by looking at a mouse. Right. But mice aren't quite humans. There's things that are toxic to them and not, right? But a better thing to do is to be able to understand how a human works from looking closely at healthcare data, even though we're not actually going to be doing a clinical study. Yeah. And you might actually get better data in that sense, uh, just even though it is like a purely computational study.